Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. This is our first demo meeting of Q4. And as Brent just mentioned, we have finally got a bit of cooler weather. So I'm gonna enjoy that while it lasts. Let's hop in. We've got some new modules. Blue Keep module finally made it into the Metasploit framework release. Uh, very exciting stuff. Again, a very heartfelt thanks to everybody who helped participate in getting it to there. Very much a team effort. Uh, our own WVU added a new module, which allows users two new ways to interact with targets, which have the double pulsar implant present, including code execution and disabling the implant itself. There's a write-up on this too, which we'll talk about more in a minute here. And I believe we'll have a demo of this. Contributor B. Coles added a new Privesk module, which exploits a vulnerability in ABRT's SOS report for versions prior to 2.7.1 using a symlink attack to overwrite the mod pro path and gain root privileges. And I believe we'll have a demo of this. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And Contributor Hoodie added a number of modules related to switch and networking device targets, including configuration importers or eaters for brocade, Cisco, and Juniper device configurations, and also a gather module for brocade targets. And I believe we'll have a demo of the configuration importers as well. And a new module for Frameworks Hardware Bridge, the contributor ship code, which moves the speedometer needle on a Mazda 2 instrument cluster. Uh, it's a, there's a cool little video uh, that's linked in the PR to a tweet uh, that he put out uh, if you want to see it in action. It's, it's fun. And some other interesting work going on. Contributor OJ Reeves plumbed in HTTP header and proxy payload options as advanced options in framework for the Windows and Python stageless interpreter payloads, where those options had been supported by the payloads, but were not accessible directly from framework. So thanks to OJ for plumbing those through. Contributor AstroZombie SG updated the Modbus scanner module to support reading discrete inputs and reading input registers, which are referred to as functions two and four, respectively, from programmable logic controller targets. Dig it. Contributor C. Noten added support for both the file colon slash slash and file colon syntaxes with the rhost option. Contributor GKWeb76 updated the group policy preference creds gathering post module to also include the group policy object name in the results. Good stuff there. In our own Jeffrey Martin bumped Frameworks version of Ruby to 265, keeping Framework current with the latest stable Ruby version available. Always good to keep up. And a few bug fixes. Our own WVU updated the stack adjustment library code so that it now handles Arch provided either as a string or as an array. And WVU also updated the Bluekeep scanner module to, by default, limit its output related to non-vulnerable hosts, making it less chatty, if you will, when you run it. And our own Dean Welch made a pass through the aux and post modules, removing targets and default targets options in those modules, which don't actually need them or use them. Always good to clean house. And a bit of bonus content this week. I was referencing the double pulsar module mentioned a few slides back. Courtesy of our own William Boo, we have a new entry in our development diary series. For those who aren't familiar with Metasploit's dev diaries, they're a look into how vulnerabilities and exploitable conditions make their way through the open source ecosystem to become stable seasoned modules and framework. In this entry, WVU walks us through his development of a new Metasploit module which interacts with a double pulsar implant and gives users the ability to remotely disable it. And in case the wild history of double pulsar and eternal blue escapes you, WVU included a refresher as well. Check it out on the research section of rapid7.com. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a huge thanks to everybody who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, indeed. And how about some demos? Mr. William Boo. Right, so here's Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, it is one of the targets we tested. Uh, it's x64, so 64-bit. <clears throat> uh, it's unpatched, just a fresh install um, and host-only networking. I've already infected with Buzzbunch and Double Pulsar. So, 
This is a uh, React OS. Actually, I will show it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's actually basically Wine as an operating system. I don't know why I didn't install this on normal Windows, what possessed me, but I thought it was funny. So um, <clears throat> uh, it's basically like Metasploit. And um, this is what I use to infect the target. Um, actually, I can, why don't I just go ahead. Um, I don't know what it is. I think it's 116. Maybe it's 114. Uh, no, whatever. Um, yeah, what are we? So we select SMB and x64. We'll run ping. I was doing output install. And it says, hey, the back door is installed. It pinged it successfully. <clears throat> Over here. Uh, we don't need to show the React OS thing, but <clears throat> all right. So we're in Metasploit here. You can see Fuzzbunch has infected uh, the target already with double pulsar. Um, using Eternal Blue, actually, uh, it needs an exploit to, to install the kernel shellcode. Um, here's a system, currently no signs of infection. We'll use double pulsar over here in Metasploit. We'll use one, check the options here, set our host, I think I already set it to 115. Set our host as well. <clears throat> um, so we can do the same as fuzz bunch over here. We can uh, check, we can check and see success. I'm gonna clear my screen, it's at the top, check. It says, hey, it's infected with double pulse. So very much like the ping from fuzz bunch. And it shows the XOR key is uh, 0x34 or whatever for both of them. From now, um, <clears throat> you can see your targets. You can execute a payload or neutralize the implant. Uh, we're going to actually set a, OK, we have the payloads, Windows X64, Metrip Reverse DCP. Um, yeah, I'm going to run it. Should work. Oh, there's this lovely defang mode here. Uh, make sure you read the warning, um, and then you'll disable it, <clears throat> and you run it, and there you go. You basically have a system shell on the target, and uh, easy as pie. Um, I mean, I guess we can actually demo use post windows manage. Uh, Escalate, capture. What's the one that does a message box? Oh, it's a payload, shoot. I guess, actually, set payload. Windows, uh-oh. This bug again. This time in, uh, I was on tab completion. <clears throat> this feels like a regression here. If it's coming through read line as well. All right, let's just, let me not use tab completion. Bonus content this week, we're finding bugs in real time. Yeah. Um, let's set the payload to Windows message box, I think. Or is it X64? X60, X64. Okay, set text. Um, I don't know, next planet. Oh, let's see if it works. Oh. Hmm. 
Oh, something happened here. What's this? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, last but not least. Come on. Yeah, we'll return. Set target neutralize. Uh, yeah, I don't think I need anything. So we run it again. It neutralizes the implant. If we check it again, it says it's not detected or disabled. If we check with fuzz bunch here, <clears throat> it says that it is gone, not present. There you go. Nice. Super cool. Really nice. Thanks, Will. Yep. Awesome. All right. How about the ABRT Privesk? Shall we? Get out of here. What is that? Automatic bug reporting tool? Yeah, yeah. That's what it stands for. Um, so at least in 2015, that was the uh, default crash handler uh, set up for Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux. Um, I don't know about now, but I already have a session. Uh, you can see here. So yeah, so um, it's pretty straightforward in that it's just another Prevest. Um, but basically what happens is whenever a process crashes on the system, um, uh, the, the crash handler uh, like starts executing and basically sets up its own directory uh, to, start, uh, to start writing uh, information in, into. Uh, but it's also um, user uh, controllable and guessable. So that allows for you to be able to write into it and create some links and yeah. Let's see, what is my session? Guys, one. Uh, I think that's all I have to do. I think I set everything up. Let's see. Um, so basically, uh, it's going to start writing some temp files and um, creating some sim links. Oh, I forgot to add that it does take a little bit, so we might need to uh, go on to the next. Possibly. <laughs> okay. Okay. We can do that. So it like scans every once in a while, like once every 10 minutes. Pretty, like pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Where's my zoom? Zoom will let you go. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Let me see here. All right. We'll do the <laughs> here thing. We'll put it in the oven. There you go. Put it in the oven. We'll return shortly after we learn how the configurators, how did they work? <laughs> how did they work? Magnets, configurators, they're all really mysterious. Yeah, I got a feeling Brent might, might tell us. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brent Cook. I'm going to be showing you some work that I actually didn't do, but, uh, but Hootie, one of our contributors, worked on. Uh, Dean Welsh also helped land some of the PRs related to this, but we'll go ahead and start this way, and I'll show you, show you what's new and cool. All right. So, um, Metasploit had the ability to parse config files from target with boxes like routers, switches, you know, kind of network gear for a while. Um, but it hasn't had the ability to do it by itself. Usually it had to shell into something. So for instance, if I were to search for a module called, I don't know, um, Cisco config, um, for a while we've had, for instance, one that could download your configuration off of TFTP. So for instance, if you have an iOS config that you uh, distribute out to all your gear over TFTP, we could just slurp it up and grid all your configurations. So what's what's cool about these new sets of modules is they actually expose this library code in a way that can be used directly. So if you found a config file, I don't know, it's like a Shea a Chef cookbook or on a paste bin or um, download it off the device itself and want to save it for later, you can always import that into Metasploit. Um, what can Metasploit actually do with the config file? Well, there's a lot of cool stuff inside of config files that can be leveraged for uh, further exploitation purposes. I'm going to widen my screen a little bit more here. Um, so uh, maybe one thing to look at would be um, Cisco, the, the Cisco config one. We'll say use zero, show options. Um, these config eaters uh, use pretty much the same kind of configuration for each one. They take a config file, so you can say set config, I don't know, Cisco.txt. I already have a config file on my computer um, for parsing. Um, you set our hosts as well, but it doesn't mean that it actually 
contacts the R host. What it means is it will attribute that configuration file to that particular host IP that you specify. So I could say 127.0.1, and it's totally fine with that as well. Um, so let's go ahead and run it. And what it has done now, it has actually scanned the configuration file and found some passwords. So if I were to type creds, for instance, um, I should see that there are a couple of passwords that it found just sitting plain text inside of the config file. This can be used then to leverage, you know, logging into more Cisco routers, maybe using the, the, the SSH logging um, module or setting the session or doing other kinds of things. Um, and this works for, for pretty much all of them. So if I were to go uh, search for Juniper config, zero, um, show options, set config, juniper.txt, run it again. You can see here, it imports all the Juniper stuff. Um, one kind of thing to note about Juniper is Juniper is just a regular Unix operating system. So um, if I look at the creds here, um, I can see that a few of them uh, look like MD5 hashes. Um, and uh, Metasploit actually identifies that. I didn't quite widen the screen quite enough, but you can see over here, John the Ripper format is MD5. So you can actually use something like uh, Metasploit's built-in John the Ripper cracker to crack these passwords directly from within Metasploit. So let's go ahead and do that now. Uh, we'll go ahead and search for um, John, and I think we want to use um, auxiliary analyze, let's see, JTR Linux. And um, I believe all we have to do is just hit run here, and it'll actually go ahead and start um, cracking all the passwords. And you see here, one of the passwords it got out of it was, was Vagrant. Um, so kind of neat stuff there. It's able to do kind of instantaneous cracking. This also gives you an idea of how fast you can crack MD5 passwords these days with a good GPU. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. If you find config files, you can download them from devices, or you maybe need to get them from other places like people's DevOps you know, repositories or PasteFan or wherever they store the configuration file these days. You can now import these into Metasploit and use them for other kinds of post exploitation. That's it. That's super cool. I'm going to swing it back over to Shelby. Sure. Cool. All right. So it looks <coughs> like it, um, this is the first time, but it failed twice for me. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got a, uh, a session oh, and UID cool. zero. So. Okay. That's Thank you. Nice. Awesome. Thanks, Shelby. Excellent.